Okay, so uh, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to our first online lecture on uh, experiments in social sciences. So uh, I think uh, Nina is the happiest person right now because he doesn't have to wake up early and come to our 1030 lectures. Okay, I'm just joking of course because uh, actually, I got a message from Mina telling me that he's very bored and he wants to start working on his graduation project. So I was just kidding with you. Okay, so uh, we are all uh, going through times that none of us has witnessed before. Uh, we are all learning new techniques uh, that I'm sure uh, will help us a lot after we get through this part time. Uh, so I'm now learning how to record my lectures. I just hope uh, my voice will not uh, make you feel bored or encourage you to sleep. Uh, so just bear, bear with me and I will try to be uh, as brief as possible. And uh, at some times I will try to be giving you interesting examples, okay? Uh, and best of luck to all of us during this hard time. Okay, so uh, in the previous lecture, we started talking about experimental economics. Uh, we talked about what an, ex an economic experiment means, uh, what are the ingredients of an economic experiment, if you remember, we talked about lack of deception, uh, the importance of having a financial incentive uh, where subjects get paid for their participation in an economic experiment, as we said before, in order to uh, make sure that the decisions they are taking during the experiment uh, are reliable. Uh, we also talked about... Uh, what an economic experiment means in the sense that uh, there should be a control group and an experiment group and that we should be changing just one variable in each treatment, okay? We cannot change more than one variable, otherwise we will not be able to know uh, the change in behavior is uh, or could be attributed to which factor. That's why uh, in every treatment, we have to change just, just one factor to introduce just one behavioral intervention, okay, in order to be able to say that the change in behavior is because of this one intervention that was introduced, okay. And we talked about the types of experiments, uh, the types of economic experiments like uh, lab experiment, uh, lab in the field experiment, uh, a field experiment, survey experiment, and a natural experiment, okay? And we stopped at uh, the famous games in experimental economics. Uh, so uh, in today's lecture, we're going to start talking about these famous games that are used by experimental economists and by behavioral eco economists in order to uh, try to understand uh, the behavior of individuals, okay? and to use different interventions to try to change this behavior. So we have uh, the most famous games are the public good game, okay, which we are going to study in today's lecture, and uh, which tries to measure uh, cooperation, the, the trait of or the social norm of cooperation, okay, uh, Another important game in experimental economics is called the trust game. Okay, I'm going to explain it in another lecture. Okay, and uh, of course this trust game is trying to measure uh, the trustworthiness of individuals, okay, and their trusting behavior. We have the ultimatum game that we uh, talked about in the first lecture that is trying to measure uh, the level of uh, altruism and egoism of an individual, okay, or maybe uh, the, the behavior of fairness, and we also have the dictator game. So in, today, in today's lecture, we're going to start by talking about the public good 
gain. Okay, so uh, the plan for this part of uh, the syllabus will be as follows. I, I will be explaining uh, each uh, game in experimental economics uh, separately. Okay, and then uh, Mazen is going to uh, give you a lecture on an application to uh, this game. Okay, how this game was used uh, in a real experiment, uh, what were the behavioral interventions that were used, okay, uh, in order to facilitate things for you and make it uh, uh, well understood from your side. So we are going to start with the first uh, famous good in experimental economics, which is the public good gain. So it's a very famous good in experimental economics literature. It has been used in many many uh, experiments. Uh, uh, I'm going to explain uh, what do we mean by public good gain, okay? Um, what is it trying to measure exactly of human behavior, okay? I'm going to give you some of the results of the uh, findings of this game in real experiments, okay? I, I will show you how we can use this game in order to uh, solve some of the problems that we face uh, uh, in our societies, for example. Okay, so let's start with uh, a public good. If you remember from our uh, public finance course, a pure public good was a good that was non-rivalry and non-excludable. These were very important characteristics of a pure public good that it was non-rivalry and non-excludable. What do we mean by non-rivalry? Non-rivalry means that I'm not negatively affected if others benefit from this good. So individuals are not competing for its consumption. There is no rivalry, no competition, okay, between individuals in consuming this pure public good. In other words, I will not be negatively affected if others consume this good this pure public good, okay? Non-excludable means that access cannot be confined or limited to certain individuals. Why? What is the justification for this? Because the production required to make this pure public good available to one person will also ensure that the good is also available to all others in a society at no extra cost. So if you remember from public finance, once this pure public good was provided to one person, the marginal cost of providing it to more people was zero, okay? That's why there is no rationale for excluding people from consuming this pure public good, because there is no extra cost from making them consume it, okay? And if you remember, uh, these pure public goods, okay, uh, could not be provided by the private sector because the private sector needs to uh, put a price for any good and these goods cannot be priced, okay? Uh, needs to be able to exclude those people who cannot pay price for it and by definition, you cannot exclude people from this pure public good. That's, what, uh, that's why it's not an option, okay? And the private sector will never offer to provide this good. What are the examples for, for, for a pure public good? Uh, the two main examples are national defense, uh, the police services in any uh, country, okay? So these are pure public goods. There is no rivalry uh, between individuals in their consumption. If I benefit from uh, a strong army that is protecting my country, okay, I will not be negatively affected if my neighbor is, on, is also benefiting from this uh, advantage, okay? or from the service, uh, and the government cannot exclude anyone, okay, from benefiting from having uh, a safe country, for example. So what is the main source of funding for pure public goods? Of course, pure public goods, as we agreed, they will be provided by the government, okay, they are never provided by private sector, so the main source of funding for them is tax revenues. They are 
uh, financed from the government budget through the use of tax revenues. However, we have a problem here that people would prefer to free ride and not pay their fair share of tax okay, to the government. They would want to uh, evade taxes and leave others pay their taxes and so at the same time they will be benefiting from the pure public good without paying any cost for it. This is the problem that most countries face, that people would want to free ride. They don't want to uh, cooperate, they do not want to contribute to this pure public good by paying their fair share of taxes. Okay, That's why the public good game in experimental economics was formulated in order to examine this hypothesis that people would want to free ride. Uh, and uh, it was there in experimental economics in order to examine what could be the behavioral interventions that could encourage me people to contribute more to this public good. So, as you can see, the name of the public good game came from uh, the value that it is trying to measure, which is people's contribution or cooperation in a pure public good. Okay, and uh, it was inserted in many experiments, okay, uh, in a control group, for example, to try to measure whether people will be cooperating or not, whether people will be contributing to the pure public good or not, okay, by paying their taxes, by pay, paying their contribution, Okay, that is required from each member of the society. And usually in the different treatments to these experiments, people try to examine different behavioral interventions okay, that could uh, encourage people to contribute more to the public good. And this will be the application that Mazin will be uh, explain, explaining to you. Uh, the, the real experiment that we conducted on Fepsians uh, I think either last year or two years ago. Okay, uh, he will explain to you the uh, what was the problem, what was the motivation behind uh, our uh, inquiry, uh, how we designed the experiment, what were the behavioral interventions that we thought of. Okay, and the hypotheses that we thought of, and the results. Okay, so this should help you in. Uh, thinking of your proposals, uh, thinking of a problem and how you can address it uh, using uh, behavioral interventions, okay, and the different games that we're going to talk about. So this is how a public good game appears in an economic experiment, either a lab experiment or uh, a lab in the field experiment. So uh, these are the instructions that we uh, tell to our subjects. As you, as you remember, if you remember, subjects are the participants in an economic experiment. So these are the, the instructions that we tell them. We tell them, please read the following instructions and take your decision. So we tell them that uh, you will be divided into groups of size n. For example, the, the group size could be four. So we could tell them uh, that you will be part of a group and this group consists of four individuals, okay? And then each group member can allocate his endowment, okay, which is 20 pounds, for example, in a private account or in a group account. So again, we give each member of the group 20 pounds as an endowment, okay? And we tell them that you have two choices you have two options, either two, or not either. You have two options on how you want to distribute your endowment, which is the 20 pounds, between the private account or the group account. So if any pound that is left in the private account remains as it is as a one pound, i.e. each point that remains in the private account remains the same, okay? Any point or any pound that you put in the public account, okay, you will get 0.4 out of it. So, a one pound that is put in the public account will give you a return of 0.4.
which is what we call NPCR, marginal per capita return. Okay, what is the marginal per capita return? This is the return for every group member, okay, out of all the contributions that are put in the public account. So, again, each member. We know subjects when they enter the lab, for example, for an economic experiment, okay, and now uh, they, they, they should be playing the public good game, okay. These are the instructions that they get, that they will be in a group of four individuals, okay. Uh, every individual or every group member will uh, get an endowment of 20 pounds, and he has to decide on how to divide this endowment between a private account and a public account. And he knows that, from the rules, that the private account, any money left in the private account will remain as it is. However, any point that is put in the public account will give each member a return of 0.4. This is, as I said, it's called marginal per capita return. So it is calculated as this fraction A over N. What is this N? This N is the group size. That's why we call it per capita okay and this n is a parameter that differs from one experiment to another okay so if in our experiment the marginal per capita return equal 0.4 this means that each member will get 0.4 of all the points contributed to the public account okay you will understand it uh, better when i give you examples later on so a member's payoff, a member of the group, his payoff will be equal to the money kept in his private account plus 0.4 times all the money that is contributed to the public account from himself and from the other members in the group. Okay, so these are the rules or the instructions of a public good game. So let me repeat again the decision that is required to be taken from each subject in a public good game. So this decision is how much this subject should contribute to the public account, okay, and how much money to leave in his private account. Again, according to the rules of the game, every pound that is left in the private account remains as it is. And every pound that is contributed to the public account or to the public fund, okay, uh, as a reflection of uh, an uh, individual's or a citizen's contribution to a public good in the form of taxes, for example, uh, this pound that is contributed to the public account, okay, will give each member a return of 0.4, okay, from all the money that is contributed to the uh, public funds from everyone in the society or in the group okay so as you can see uh, a self-interested individual okay uh, would definitely want to um, keep as much uh, money as possible in his private account because every pound will remain as it is okay but would want everyone else in the group to contribute something to the public fund so that he gets return out of this public fund without he or she contributing himself or herself. Okay. In other words, every self-interested individual would want to free ride. Okay. So if this game was played once, in other words, in a one-shot public good game, it is played just once in the experiment and that's it. The Nash equilibrium, a la neoclassicals, okay, is for everyone to contribute nothing to the public good, because every individual would want to free ride, okay, and every individual would know because of this common information, okay, or common knowledge uh, assumption that we talked about before uh, from the neoclassical theory, okay. Everyone would know that everyone else would free ride, okay? So the Nash equilibrium would be for everyone to free ride or to contribute zero to the public good game.
Okay, so this will be the dominant strategy in a one-shot game, according to the neoclassicals, who are assuming that everyone is self-interested. And everyone knows that everyone else is thinking the same. Okay, however, as we will see from the coming examples, social welfare will be maximized if everybody contributes his or her entire endowment to the public fund or to the public account. How? We're going to look at the next examples and uh, clarify this point. So in these examples, we are going to uh, see uh, different contributions by different members of the society and how these different contributions will affect the, uh, the payoff of every individual or every member in the society and will affect social welfare at the end. So let's start by the first example. Suppose, again, that there are four members in a society or in a group, okay, uh, according to our instructions, and each is having an, an endowment of 20 pounds. If each member, including yourself, decided to give the maximum to the public account, this means that your total income will be, let's see the steps in order to reach the answer to this question. So here, as we agreed, there are four members in the society and everyone is endowed with 20 pounds. And everyone is asked to choose how to distribute this 20 pounds between a private account and a public account. Suppose that in this example, every member in the society decided to give the maximum or to contribute the maximum to the public good or to the public account. Okay, This means that the public account will have 20, what will be the sum of contributions? It will be 20 times 4, which is 80. Okay, so what will be my total payoff? Let's agree that the total payoff of every individual in the society will be equal to the income from the private account. So my total payoff will be my income from that remains in my private account, okay, plus the income from that I will be getting or receiving from the public account. Let's try to take each part separately. So the income from the private account will be equal to the 20 pounds, which is my endowment, minus my contribution to the public fund. This, is, this will be the money that will remain in my private account and which will remain as it is, because as I said, one pound in the private account will remain as one pound. So. According to this example, the income from my private account is equal to my endowment, which is 20, minus my contribution, which is according to this example is 20, which is equal to zero. What about the income that I will be getting from the public account? The income that I will be getting from the public account will be equal to 0.4, okay, which is the MPCR, the marginal per capita return, times the sum of contributions in the public account from all members of the society. So this will be equal to 0.4 times 80 because in this example, every member in the society decided to contribute the maximum, decided to contribute all his endowment. Okay, so it will be 0.4 times 80, which is 32. This means that I will be getting from the public account 32 pounds. Therefore, my total income will be 32 that I will be getting from the public account plus the zero from my private account because I donated or I contributed everything to the public account, okay, which will be 32 pounds, which as you can see is higher than your initial endowment. So when everybody contributes everything to the public account, okay, in other words, we can apply to real world problems like taxes, if everyone contributes his fair share of tax, okay, everyone in the society will benefit. So my total income will be 32 as we agreed, and the payoff of each other member in the society will also be 32, because every other member will calculate his total payoff in the same way. Okay, so social welfare will be equal 4 times 32, which is 128 pounds. But initially, Okay, everyone, when everyone got just an endowment of 20, so the summation of these endowments was just 80. Okay, 
So when everyone contributed to the public good, social welfare increased and reached 128, which means that it is for everyone's benefit, okay, that everyone contributes the maximum to the public account, okay? In other words, everyone will benefit if everyone cooperate, okay, to the public good, because this is a good that everyone is going to benefit from, okay, including yourself. So it's very good or it is the best, okay? The best scenario is for everyone to contribute the maximum so that everyone will benefit even more than your initial endowment. Let's look at the other examples in order to, uh, for you to better understand uh, the public good game. So this example is uh, related to the neoclassical assumptions, okay, and their assumption that every individual is self-interested and no one will contribute anything to the public good, okay? So again, suppose there are four members, everyone is having an endowment of 20 pounds. If each member, including yourself, decided to give nothing to the public account, i.e. you are becoming selfish and you know that everyone else will think the same, okay? So you will decide not to contribute anything to the public account. This means that your total income will be, again, let's use the same rule, your total income will be your income from the private account, your private account, plus the income that you will be getting from the public account. Your income from the private account will be 20 minus your contribution, which is zero, okay? So income from the private account will be 20. Your income from the public account will be 0.4 times the sum of the contributions in the public account, which is again zero, because no one decided to contribute anything to the public account, okay? So it's zero. Therefore, your total income will remain the same as your initial endowment, which is 20 pounds. And the same for the other members. Everyone will keep his 20 pounds and he will get nothing extra because everyone decided to free ride. And this is the assumption of the neoclassical theory. third example is on the selfish member who would wish to free ride but at the same time who would hope that others would not free ride okay so again we have four members everyone is having an endowment of 20 if you contributed nothing i.e you you decided to free ride and the others contributed 60 pounds which means that every one of the other three members decided to contribute the maximum to the group account or to the public account. This means that your total income will be the following. Again, it is equal to your income from your private account, which is 20 minus your contribution, and your contribution in this case is zero, so you are keeping 20 pounds in your private account, plus the income that you will be getting from the public account, okay, even if you free ride, you will still be getting 0.4 times the sum of the contributions in the public account, which is 0.4 times 60 equal 24. So in this case, your total income will be 20 plus 24, which is 44. Each other member in the group, however, will have a payoff of 24 pounds because they are keeping nothing in their private accounts. Okay, so... That's why everyone will be hoping to free ride, okay, uh, on the hope that the others will not free ride, but with the end result that no one will contribute anything to the public account because everyone is going to do the same, okay? So uh, this, is, this will be the case of inferior Nash equilibrium with no coordination, okay? So... This is the, uh, the, the end result, which, uh, which is uh, in line with the neoclassical theory, okay, that everyone is going to free ride, okay, and the end result will, will be that no one will contribute anything to the public account. So the Nash equilibrium will be an inferior Nash equilibrium 
with no coordination and no cooperation whatsoever between the members of the society. Last example shows you the case if you decided to contribute the maximum to the public fund, but everyone else in your group decided to free ride. So in this case, your uh, total income will be as follows. Your income from your private account, which is zero because you decided to contribute everything to the public account. The income you will be getting from the public account is 0.4 times the sum of contributions in the public account, which are mainly coming from your contribution. So it's 0.4 times 20, which is 8. So you will end up with a total income of just 8, which is much lower than your initial endowment. But why is this happening? Because it is only you who decided to contribute to the public account, okay? But everyone else in your society was so selfish, okay, that they decided not to contribute anything to the public account. So every other member, his payoff is 28, which is their initial endowment of 20 plus the 8 they are getting from the public account, mainly from your contribution. Okay, that's why everyone will, will be hoping, okay, all the other group members will be hoping uh, to free ride and others to contribute so that they benefit, okay, from their private account plus benefit from the public account that is uh, resulting from the contributions of others. But because everyone will think the same, the end result will be that everyone will be free riding, okay, according to the neoclassical assumptions. But let's see how, when this good was, uh, when this game was played in real experiments, how subjects behaved. When the public good game was played in real experiments, it was found that subjects contribute on average between 30 and 50 percent of their endowment. So subjects do not uh, contribute the maximum to the public account. And at the same time, they do not free ride, most of them. When I give this percentage, I'm talking about a significant number of subjects who played this PGG or public good game in real experiments. So their contributions were on average between 30 and 50% to the public account. Okay, uh, which means that the uh, prediction of the neoclassical theory was wrong because according to the neoclassical theory everyone who plays this public good game should free write but this was not the case in real experiments and it was also found that higher mpcr marginal per capita returns okay the higher is the mpcr the higher is the contribution to the public fund because people feel that they will be getting higher and higher percentage of the public fund. Also allowing communication among subjects, okay, allowing subjects to communicate during the experiment, this also contributes to higher contributions to the public fund. Uh, positive framing, punishment, when, when group members are allowed to punish those who defect, okay, this also affects contributions to the public fund. So, uh, many behavioral interventions were introduced in uh, different experiments, okay, and it was shown that all these factors uh, lead to an increase in the average contributions. And this will be mainly what Nazan will be explaining to you in our uh, real experiments that we conducted uh, using this PGG, uh, Public Good Game. And uh, he will be talking again about the different behavioral interventions and how they affected the contributions of the subjects. So, uh, in this slide, I will show you how we can use a real-world problem, okay, uh, and uh, use a public good game in order to uh, try to solve this real-world problem or to characterize this, this real-world problem using a public good game. <clears throat> I'm sure that there are uh, five uh, 
students will be very happy with this example because it is uh, mainly their uh, research question in their graduation project. And these students are uh, Ahmed Ghandar, uh, Rose, Abdul Rahman, Abdullah, and Saif. Okay? So uh, I hope uh, I can uh, uh, explain your research question in the right way. Okay, so in Egypt, for example, traffic is horrible. Okay, so traffic is a nightmare. And everyone would gain from more public transportation and from more people or more Egyptians using these public transportation. Okay, so this is mainly the problem that we are facing, uh, horrible traffic. And the result for this uh, reduction of this traffic is the use of public transportation and uh, more people relying on public transportation instead of their private cars or private means of transportation. Because by doing this, there will be less cars in the street, okay, which could help solve our problem. So how can this problem be related to a public good gain? Okay, and how we can use different behavioral interventions, okay, in order to try to solve this problem. This is what we're going to see in the next slide. Okay, so back to, uh, to our uh, uh, example, okay, of the heavy traffic in Cairo and how we can use a public good game in order to uh, characterize this problem and try to solve it using different behavioral interventions. Okay, so the best scenario will be for every one of us, or in other words, I will be very happy, okay, and I will be maximizing my utility if I'm using my private car to go to FEPS, but at the same time, everyone else is using public transportation, okay, because in this case, I will be enjoying my car, okay, uh, staying alone in the car, and at the same time, enjoying not very crowded streets in Cairo because everyone else will be using public transportation, which means that there will be less other private cars in the streets, okay? So this will be the best scenario for every individual, okay? This is the problem. This is what we call social dilemma because for every individual to maximize his or her utility, okay, the best thing will be that this individual uses his private car, but that everyone else uses public transportation, okay? However, the problem is that everyone is thinking the same. That's why we are having this social dilemma, that uh, I will be very happy to use my private car, but everyone else uses public transportation, okay? This will be the best. Uh, but I really hope that everyone does the same. Mm -hmm. Or, I'm sorry, I would be very happy if everyone uses this public transportation. But this will not be the case, because everyone is going to think the same way I'm thinking. Okay? So, how can we use a public good game to characterize this problem? So, let's assume that player I has an endowment, E, okay, which we call E, which is the number of journeys he has to travel to FEPS. Okay? This player can allocate these journeys between two options. The public transportation, using public transportation, which will be this individual's contribution to the public good, which belongs to a set between zero and E, which means that he can either decide to not to use public transportation, in this case C will be equal to zero, or he can decide to always go to FEPS using public transportation. In this case, his contribution will be his total endowment, E, or anything in between. Okay, this is the first decision. The second decision is how many journeys to FEPS is he going to use his, his private car in? Okay, and this will be equal to the number of journeys to FEPS minus 
the number of times he's going to use public transportation, which is E minus C, okay? So what will be the payoff to this individual? Pi I, which is the payoff to this individual, will be equal to his initial endowment, which is the number of journeys to FEPS, okay? Minus how many times he decided to go using public transportation, as if it is his contribution to, to, to the public good from our previous example, okay? Plus, he's going to benefit a lot, okay, if from everyone else using public transportation, i.e., he is going to get a return, which is MPCR, the marginal per capita return, okay, which could be any number. In our previous example, it was 0.4. It is this A over N, okay, A is a parameter, differs from one experiment to another, okay, divided by n, n is the number of individuals going to FEPS, okay? So this is the MPCR multiplied by the summation of contributions of every individual going to FEPS, okay? Which is the summation of CJ, where J is equal to, from 1 to n, all the contributions of everyone going to FEPS, and these contributions are in the form of their use of the public transportation. So this individual, this is the payoff function of our individual, or, or of every individual. This payoff function, okay, which will maximize his utility, okay, this will be equal to my initial endowment minus my contributions to the public good, okay. This first term is exactly uh, the same as the income from the private account that we talked about in the previous example. Okay, plus A over N, which is the MPCR, which is the return I'm getting from everyone's contributions to the public account or everyone's else usage of the public transportation. Okay, so the best thing for me is to contribute nothing to the public good, to never to use the public transportation, always use my private car, but on the condition that everyone else uses the public transportation. Okay, however, this will never happen because everyone will be thinking the same. Okay, that is why here there is this social dilemma. And it will be the best if everyone uses public transportation. Mm -hmm. So the theoretical side uh, of this uh, problem is the following. There is this social dilemma. Okay, there is always this social dilemma between my private interest. Okay, and... The, the social welfare of the whole society. This happens when? When in our equation or in our parameters that we use in the experiment, if 1 over n is less than a over n is less than 1. What is this? 1 is the return from the private account, which is, as we said from the previous example, 1 pound that remains in the private account remains 1 pound. Okay? a over n is the marginal per capita return, which is again from our previous example, it was 0.4, okay? So here, the 1 is greater than the 0.4, okay? Which is greater than 1 over n. n is the group size or the number of members in my society, okay? So as long as the return from the private account is greater than the marginal per capita return, which is also greater than 1 over the number of individuals in my society, which is always the case, okay, in, in all experiments that use the public good game, this social dilemma should exist, okay, by using parameters that should guarantee this equation, okay, that the return from my public uh, account or my public fund should be greater than the marginal per capita return should be greater than 1 over n. So that... Uh, this, this equation will guarantee that uh, self-interested individuals, okay, although they want to enjoy using their private cars, okay, uh, they should know that there will be a higher return to the whole society in the form of social welfare, okay, if, if everyone contributed or cooperated. Mm -hmm. This is what the main idea that we want to reflect from uh, a public good, that 
uh, everyone should cooperate, everyone should contribute, okay? And that social welfare will increase, okay, even more than the, the, the money in each individual's private account, okay? But on the condition that everyone should contribute. This is what we mean by social dilemma, okay? And in most experiments, uh, N was in the literature, in the economic, uh, in the experimental economics literature, N was four, the endowment was 19 or 20, and A was three, for example, okay? But in our previous example, A was 1.6. So, <coughs> excuse me, this was all what I wanted to tell you about the public good game. Uh, inshallah, when you listen to Mazen's presentation, which we're going to post uh, today as well, uh, you should get a clearer idea about what we mean by public good game, how we use it to solve real world problems, and what could be the behavioral interventions that we could use in order to encourage people to contribute more. Of course, I'm not going to tell you about uh, what uh, Ahmed, uh, Rose, Abdurrahman, uh, Abdullah, and Saif uh, decided to use for behavior interventions, okay? project But they were thinking of ways by which they can convince individuals to contribute more to the public good, to use more public transportation, okay? And hopefully, inshallah, when they do their, their experiment, they will uh, get significant results for their behavioral interventions, uh, which means that they will really affect people's behavior, okay? That's all for today's lecture and good luck. Bye.